Well, as I said, I've been filling in for uh, for Jim in the men's class for a good little bit, and uh, then Doug called and said his knee I got hurt at work and asked me if I would fill in. So uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit this morning through Titus. We've been going through the the book of Titus. We just talked. Uh, Started a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to continue to share in that. And I like to, and I hope it's not inappropriate for me to have coffee up here, but I do. So, morning. morning. I want to read something to you out of a commentary that I had before we get started, because it really it deals with with this chapter, <coughs> this book actually. And it says this. It says, some people say that it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as you do the right thing. However, Paul's letter to Titus contradicts that sort of thinking. He knew that people became what they think, and that everything they do is shaped by what they believe. Goes on to say, that's why he urged Titus, his very close and valued associate, who was pastoring a church on the island of Crete, to speak the things which was proper for sound doctrine. That's just another word for what we are being taught. It's very important to be accurate in what you're being taught. And unfortunately, it's as we see, we'll see this morning, what was going on with these churches on the island of Crete is the same thing going on today. There's a lot of falsehoods and uh, false gospel being taught in so-called churches today. But he goes on to say this. If you look, and we won't we'll get to this morning, but in chapter 2 and verse 1 it says this in Titus, But as for you, talking about to Titus, teach the things which are in agreement with sound doctrine, which produces men and women of good character whose lifestyle identifies them as true Christians. I thought that was a pretty powerful verse. That the things that we are being taught in our lifestyle, can somebody point at us and say, yeah, you're one of them. You know, you're one of them Christian people. Or are we like some that says, well, my, my faith and my relationship with God is personal, and that's just between me and God. We keep all that to ourselves. And I would submit to you, if you are along those lines, it's not, uh, it's not a good way to be. It's not what Scripture tells us we should be. We should be letting others see Christ through the way we live in our life. And you don't have to go around with a big sign on your back, and it doesn't mean anything to have the bracelets and the bumper stickers. It don't mean nothing. It's how we live. What is people seeing in our lives that really is going to reflect? What are we being taught, and do we believe what we're being taught? The commentary goes on, and again, if anybody has any comments or questions, feel free to stop them or talk and discuss it. That's one thing that's kind of nice about Sunday school. It's a little different than when we're out in worship, that you can do that. If you've got a question, you can stop and discuss it and see what God's Word says about it. And you may have to if I don't see you, raise your hand or something, just kind of say, hey, <laughs> pay attention. But it goes on to say this. It says the commentary um, says that Paul knew the correct living is a product of correct belief. Error can never lead to godliness. Only truth produces genuine Christ-likeness. It goes on to say, in our world today, many streams of thought they claim to be true, yet they produce nothing that even approaches the character, integrity, and humility of Christ. That's why believers need to pay attention to the, the teaching they receive. Does it square with Scripture? Does it honor Christ? Does it, does it reflect what Paul wrote in chapter 1, verse 1, when he said this? He said, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's chosen ones, and to lead and encourage them to recognize 
and pursue the knowledge of the truth which leads to godliness. And the question we always have to ask ourselves, are we pursuing that knowledge? And where are we what are we pursuing? Where are we, you know, where we think we're getting that? Are we um, are we going to the bookstores and buying all the the best Christian books? Are we getting a lot of knowledge out of that. You listen to a lot of radio. Listen, you know. I would just suggest that there's nothing, and please don't misunderstand that there's some good Christian books out there. I would suggest that you be careful because just because they're in a Christian bookstore doesn't mean they're biblically sound. But if you want to get true knowledge, if you want to get produce true godliness, you've got that book. You don't have to go buy it. It's called the Bible. That's all you really need. Uh, there's nothing against, you know, other stuff, you know, but do not ever replace God's word with with man's word. If we look here, and I'm just a, a quick review of some of the things that we've already covered, we're going to see that uh, Titus had a large task to keep. You know, he started out. Paul started out here in these churches, and he had to leave. He left Titus there to finish and to uh, continue working on building the church there in Crete. Uh, as I said earlier, Crete, the churches there had the same problem we have today. Many of the churches uh, were promoting false gospel. They had a lot of ungodliness going on in them. They had a lot of misstructure, um, people just being ungodly. Paul wrote this letter to Titus. Although Titus was sound and faithful in his doctrine, um, it kind of reminds you of the same encouragement and counsel he had given Timothy because uh, he knew he was going to face a lot of opposition just as we will face when you stand for the truth, you will face a lot of opposition. So I want to start out with a couple things that we found in uh, the beginning in Titus chapter in the first three just the first three verses, we found this, that one, believers are God's elect. That's a, a doctrine that a lot of people will argue against. A lot of people who profess to be Christian argue against that. It goes on, to, uh, we found out in, the, in those uh, first three verses that uh, living out God's truth produces godliness. When we live out what we are being taught, in God's word, it will produce something, and that something is godliness. We also found out that <clears throat> we also found out that uh, salvation was set before time began. If you're a Christian, if you're a true believer, and that's one of the things that's always amazed me, that was decided before even time began, before we was even thought of. We also found out in those first three verses that our hope for eternal life is a promise from God. And, we, and the biggest thing we found out is that God cannot lie out of those three verses. <coughs> so if you're wondering if, if God is telling you that we'll do what he says he will do, it's, it's impossible for God to lie. I could lie to you. I could tell you something that may not be true. Uh, maybe your neighbor could lie to you. It is impossible for God to tell us. When we read his promises in his word, we can go to the bank with that. We can rest assured that what God says will be, will be. It says this in the first three verses. This is Paul a bond server to God and apostle, apostle special, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Jesus Christ for the faith of God's chosen ones and to lead and encourage them to recognize and pursue <clears throat> the knowledge of the truth, as we just read that earlier, which leads to godliness. Verse 2, 
based on the hope and divine guarantee of eternal life, which God, who is ever truthful and without deceit, promised before the ages of time began. And at the appointed time, he has made his word and revealed it as his message through the preaching which was entrusted to me according to the command of God our Savior. It seems like a lot of information there in three verses. There's some stuff that we, we hold really dear to those, those things. In verses five, 5 through 9, we find out some, we find him giving uh, Titus some instruction on how to find godly men to lead the church, don't we? <clears throat> and one of the things that we saw last week, and uh, Jim Mudd brought this up, these are qualifications that a leader of the church must have. And the reason I think it's relevant for us, I'm thinking, well, shouldn't we strive to be these things as well? Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a, an elder. But I think as believers in Christ, we are all called to strive to be these things. And some of the things that we see in there, you know, it says if a man is blameless, I think we all should all strive to be blameless. That's not perfect. In context, that's not talking about sinless perfection because we know we all sin. But there shouldn't be a pattern in our life where people can say, yeah, he's just, you know, he says one thing on Sunday, but he, he look at him Monday through Wednesday. Look at him through the week. They shouldn't be able to go and, and have an, an absolute thing. You cannot stop people from lying about you. Okay? Let's get that straight. I could go say anything I want to want to about somebody. <clears throat> but as a believer in Christ, if somebody, if we are accused of something, hopefully it's a lie. Hopefully we ain't running around cheating on our wives. Or, you know, that's just one thing. It could be many th anything. But that's, uh, you know, it talks about being a husband of one wife, you know, a Christian man. Shouldn't be around looking around, you know. He doesn't yet. We should have our mind focused on one person in our life, and that's our wife. That's what that is referring to. We talk about not being self-willed. We got any self-willed people in here? That's something we all fight for, honest. Because we like things our way. You can see where that would be a problem in the church, don't you? You can see how that would be a problem in your family? And I just jotted down a couple of these things. What about not quick temper? Is it a good thing we don't got a, a pastor or that's quick to get angry? What about us? Is that something that we should strive for? In self-control through the Spirit. Again, these are things that, as Jim said last week, in church leader must have. And I would just submit that these are things that we, as believers, should strive to be. We people should see these characteristics in our life as well. Sober-minded, the lover of what is good. How do we know what is good? Come on, guys. It's ain't pocket science. They told me this was an advanced class. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we always refer back to God's Word? Isn't that how we determine what is good? <clears throat> Not our opinion. And I'm not going to go ask Tim, Tim, what do you think about this? Do you think that it's okay if I do this? Now, there's nothing wrong with going to a brother or sister to get counsel. 
we're supposed to do that. We should do that. But hopefully the, the advice that they're giving you is coming out of here. And not, anytime you hear somebody say, well, let me tell you what I think, run <laughs> as fast as you can. As believers, our first, somebody comes to us for advice, our first re reaction should, one, be grabbing this Bible here and say, well, let's see what God says about that. Because that's the only way. Um, a little comment on that is, yes, everything for our life is in God's words. What I've seen some <coughs> people do, and I've been guilty of it, as maybe they have something wrong in their life, if this this is where it's at, if you want to know what it's in there. But what I've seen people do is they will go to it and start reading, but cut themselves short on not finishing all the text, and they don't get the full meaning. They say, well, it, it you know, it stops here, so I guess the rest of it's all right. Is that really mm -hmm. what it says? Read all the text on that. Yeah. Um, they want to read a verse or two because it fits their narrative. That's not what we're supposed to do. That's right. That's right. We don't. We don't want to manipulate Scripture to fit to how we want it, something we want to do or somehow we want to live. We want to let Scripture manipulate our life to change us to be like Christ. And you got to take it in context to do that. You can go out there and find verses that maybe back up, you know, one of the ones that I think of all time that, you know, where people are argue when you tell them, you know, believers really shouldn't be drinking, you know. Well, they'll say, well, you know, this Bible says drink a little for your stomach, and, you know, they had wine back then, and Jesus made wine, and all, you know, always wanting to get as close to that line as they can. And I would suggest, guys, as believers, we should try to stay away from that line as far as we can. Not see how close we can get to it. Another thing that we saw in 5 through 9 is that holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, and that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, hope to exhort and convict those who contradict it. Shouldn't we have those? that desire to be able to do that also. When people come and, you know, when we see somebody maybe in error, I would hope, again, you said, well, that's, I don't think that to do me, that's talking about uh, pastors and elders and leadership of the church. Well, yeah, those are characteristics that they must have. But that doesn't let us off the hook that we can just live any way we want. We should strive to be as much like Christ as they do. Specifically in that area right there that Drew just mentioned, uh, yes, it is the, the duty of the pastor. The pastor must have that ability. But part of that ability is to teach you how to discern. That's ultimately discernment, right? Um, you need to know why you can't watch Joel Osteen or Creflo Dollar or Kenneth Copeland for those people. Um, that should be an attribute that you strive to attain also be able to to convict those that contradict or you know be able to look Good at point, this, yeah. just to be able to look and say, okay, this is why it's not biblical. This is why he's a heretic because the Bible says this, this, and this. That makes sense. Good point. You know, we're told that we should always be ready to give an account for the hope that we have. Right? <clears throat> we should know and. It's not just a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's one thing to know not to do something or why. It's important to know why, I think. You know, the things that we do, you know, why are we doing it? You know, don't do it out of compulsion. I hope there's nobody in here today that's here just so they can check off the box of why I went to church Sunday. I hope it's because you love the Lord and you want to be around His people. You want to hear His teaching. 
you know. I hope that the life that we live, we don't live it because God's going to, you know, although He will when you're just obedient, correct us. But our actions should be projected through our love for God. Does that make sense? You know? Not because somebody's telling you to do something, but because we have a genuine love for the Lord. You should be excited to be here. Well, you would hope. And yet we find so often we, you, we're having to beg people to come to church. And we had a, a discipleship class that we just wrapped up. And I'm going to tell you, that shouldn't be. If you really love the Lord... You shouldn't have to be, people shouldn't be having to put a guilt trip on you to be here. You shouldn't want to be here. Paul tells us this, and you know, he asked the question, why is it important to have men in place to oversee the church? Because <laughs> those who lead us and guide the church, one or two things are happening here. You're either going in the right direction, you're going in the wrong direction. There's no other option. There's no middle ground. You're either being taught and the truth is being proclaimed and you are growing and maturing in Christ or you're not. You're not being godly, becoming God because you're not getting the truth. And, and a little bit of the truth don't cut it. You know, you heard the old say maybe on TV or something, you know, <coughs> truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, something like that. We've got to have all of God's truth, not just parts of it. And I can tell you there's a lot of churches today that are just not, don't want to deal with it. They give you enough of the feel-good stuff. They, uh, one of the problems i found, they think, a lot of them have become where they think this is not sufficient to accomplish what they what they want to accomplish. And I have to tell you, if anything besides God, where there's nothing else that's going to work, there's nothing else going to draw a man to saving faith other than his word. You can have all the programs you want. You can have, you know, the big orchestra and, and the fancy, you know, lights and stuff and the large choir, but I'm telling you, if you're trying to appeal to people's flesh to get them in, you will have to continue to, to appeal to their flesh to keep them, and eventually it becomes a revolving door because they're always going to be looking. If this isn't enough for somebody, they're always going to be looking for the next high, the next thing that gets them excited. Paul tells us in verses 10, through 16 says this, I want to share it. He said, for the, you know, we asked the question, why is it important to have godly, sound doctrine men over the church? And he tells us in these, uh, these next verses, he said, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, which is referring to the Jews there. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things they, they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. These testimonies are true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So Titus had some stuff to deal with, didn't he? Does the church, does the church today have stuff to deal with? Do we have uh, insubordinate people sometimes sitting in, out in the church?
That means defying of authority, by the way. Unruly, disobedient. We fall, people would fall on it. Is that, we ever, ever run into that in the church? Somebody just wants to be defiant, they don't care what church leadership said, they've got a better ideal, maybe. I jotted down a couple of these things. It's not a complete list, but some of the things that, that I've kind of seen, one is insubordinate people, people who didn't like to be told what to do, you know. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to find here in a little bit why it's important that we should be listening to our pastors. We should not take that lightly. It's a big responsibility and they're going to be held accountable. What about idle talkers? We know God, the church doesn't have gossipers in it, do we? Now again, this is in context. What I'm trying to get across is that what they was dealing with then and that Titus was you know, Paul was telling Titus, look, get men that can deal with this, godly men with sound, uh, a sound background, sound doctrine, faithful men, because this is going on in the churches. I'm just saying we're dealing with the same problems today. And that's why we need good sound teaching, good sound leadership. False teachers, right? Yeah. What he's talking about. Yeah. talking about the false teachers. And they're everywhere. I mean, this you can say, well, that was back then. That's today. In, in That's this, this morning. In this case, it was the Judaizers. Uh, in our case, it's you know, the health wealth guys, like I said earlier on TV. And right there at the end of verse 11, it says, for the sake of dishonest gain. Mm -hmm. They're always about the money. They're always about the money, exactly. It's always about them. We should always be about Christ. Everything that a godly man does points up, never inward. One of the telltale signs in our own culture today is that if you donate to my ministry, God's going to bless you. Yeah. And I haven't been able to find that verse in here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Dishonest game. I, I, keep, I keep looking, but I ain't found it yet. <laughs> Again, it goes back to, that's why it's so important to know the truth, mm -hmm. to be taught the truth. So when you hear stuff, because a lot of times they're going to mix stuff in there that you're thinking, you know, that don't sound half bad. Because it'll have just a little bit of truth in it, but it'll have a whole lot of false truth in it. Okay. Again, it's just important to know. Well, they're usually very powerful speakers. Yeah. They're, they're usually having the ability to, to woo the masses. Um, they're masters they're, of lying. Yeah, the flamboyant. They're, you know, appeal to your emotions. E e even you know, even our politicians today, the ones that are able to deliver speeches and and uh, you know things like that. I mean, you know, who they would consider the greats. FDR was able to deliver a speech. Um, you know, Adolf Hitler. He was very good at speaking. Uh, same thing. They're able to deliver messages that. Yeah. Uh, that are convict, or that not necessarily convict, but that move you emotionally. Uh, you know, the way we like to give them the title that, oh, that means they're Holy Spirit filled in, in our culture. That does not mean they're Holy Spirit filled just because they're good at delivery. I go back to always, whatever you hear, whatever somebody's telling you or teaching you, filter it. You know, the Bible tells us to take every thought captive. We should filter everything through God's Word and see if it measures up. You know, or is there, does that, you know, and if you're a believer, you've got the Holy Spirit, and it's going to set off the little red light that says, something don't sound quite right with that. Well, if that happens, you need to, you need to push the pause button. You know, I'm reminded of a guy here, and it's been some time ago, and some of you may have never heard of this guy, Jim Jones in Guyana. Look at all the people that he had deceived convinced, you know. It amazes me how 
how people can be swayed one way or the other. Well, we all need a Savior. We might not have all been given to people who are into money or whatever, but uh, nobody was born a Christian, so we were saved out of something, right? I mean, mm-hmm. We might not, and hopefully none of us in here are watching Kenneth Copeland or any of those teachers, but I guarantee you, if you're at work, you're working around some that are. Sure. And you just need to be open and ready. It might be the book on their desk that you can say, good grief, in your mind, what are they reading? And you can share with them, hey, can I share something with you and share the gospel with them? Absolutely. That's what we have to be, just like it said here earlier. We have to hold fast the word and be able to contradict and exhort people in sound doctrine. Not only the pastors, but all of us need to be able to do that. Clearly articulate how to be saved. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And we're to follow his lead. Talks about being subversive, to subvert, to undermine the power and authority of a system or institution, to be stabilized, to unsettle something, to disrupt, pervert, distort, and bitter. You guys ever know anybody that professed to be a Christian that would fall on those lines? You know, I've seen people do that, that say they're a Christian, yet they undermine the authority of the church. They pervert things, make up lies. And again, I would say this, that that's, although that sometimes I think that tells you that they're not what they claim to be, they will have to answer for that. When you attack God's leadership, you will answer for that at some point. And we need to understand this is not, if it's done correctly, it's not done by committee vote not done by a raise of hands. These are men that have been chosen very carefully, or should be. Uh, it's not always the case in some churches. It's more of a popularity contest on how leadership is chosen. But if they were ordained by God and the will of God, and you come against that, I suggest you've got it if you're going to have issues down the road. Verse 16 is an important verse. I made a note here that says that these type of people profess to know God. They go to church. They may even be a teacher in the church and yet fall into these kind of activities or this kind of lifestyle. So he asks, what does Scripture say about these type of actions? I was reminded of Hebrews 13 where it says in verse 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable to you. Not much gray area there, is there? As the old saying goes, one of them said, God told me, run the other way. <laughs> Another verse that kind of came to mind was in 2 Timothy, where we was reminded of this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. That sounds familiar. I just read the newspaper this morning. Yeah. So what really got me was right there at the end, from such people, turn away from those kind of people. Now I will say this, 
We should still try to share the gospel with them. But now again, if we find people like this that's in the church, we've got a problem. And they need to be, of course, Scripture tells us how to deal with that. But it, it, it kind of jumped out at me, it says here, where it says, having a form of godliness, but denying his power. What, is, what does that mean? That's like acting like you're a Christian, but not really letting God change you? Has it been a new creation? Or have you just kind of walked an aisle? And there's this, and I forget this guy's name. He's probably some kind of pastor. It's Greg. Greg Block. Block. No, he's on Laurel or something. <laughs> See, I don't know. But anyway, he's got this commercial about how you need God, which is that. It's true. But he says, all you got to do is say this prayer. If you'll say this prayer, yeah. you know, like saying that prayer is, is, is magic. The saving grace that we have. And I think that's what's happened to a lot of people, that they've said a prayer at some point, maybe walked an aisle, and they think, now, I'm a Christian. But there's never really been an impact on their life. There's really never been a change. And I'm here to tell you that if you are saved and you are a believer, God has come in and you you cannot be the same person. You won't be perfect, but you ain't like you used to be. You've got a desire to be something different. You don't you stop wanting to please yourself and you want to please God. And that's not normal. Right? I mean, because we're born wanting to please ourselves, ain't we? Isn't that kind of how a natural man is? Woman? Verse 16 says they profess to know God, but it's one thing to, to profess, it's another thing to possess. Yeah. And, and in John 10, 27, the Lord himself says, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So again, it goes back, you're going to be known by your fruit. And the sad thing is, it's not just that you do harm to yourself when you don't live out the, the message that we say we, we have and the life that we we say we are. And we don't, you know, you reflect back on the cross. You reflect back on Jesus Christ. And I'm much more concerned about that than what people think about me. Does that make sense? It goes on to say... You know, I looked at, you know, we talk about peaceful gossiping, and I, again, I just picked out a couple of these because they seem to be easy, low hanging fruit in the church. People running around saying, You hear about my pastor this or so and so this? I'm telling you, if you're doing that, stop. You got an issue with a person, go to that person and deal with it. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, verse. 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So if anything's coming out of our mouth about somebody, it should be what? Can it be something to build them up, to encourage them? Unfortunately, again, it goes back to why I even bring this up this morning. I think it's important for believers to maybe pause and say, you know, my life, if I'm living, am I really living this Christian life? You know, I say I am. I go to church every Sunday, you know. But is my life really reflecting that I've been, been changed by God? Am I doing the same things I did before Christ? And I submit to you, if you're living the same way or if you know somebody, and I'm probably preaching to the choir in here, but if you know somebody that professes to be a believer and there's no evidence there, it may be a, an opportunity to share with them. It goes on to say this in Proverbs chapter 6. I thought this was interesting. Again, it goes back to that Second Timothy passage. It says six things that the Lord hates, yes, seven, are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, 
the heart that devises wicked plans. Anybody ever know anybody that's going to try to? I'm going to go and I'm going to get that past. I'm going to get, we're going to make him pay. Well, I don't like this elder or whatever. You know, ever, ever seen anything like that go on? In church, I'm telling you, it does. And it's wrong. And for those that would participate in something like that, I seriously doubt that they know the Lord at all. Goes on to say, free that feet that are swift, running to evil, a false witness who speak lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. God hates that. Bible talks so much about unity, doesn't it? You ever, have you ever seen one that just walks around us all the time trying to stir up something? James chapter 1 would remind it, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So I would just encourage you that before you go around saying something about someone, especially a brother in Christ or sister in Christ, you may want to hit the pause button and think about it. You might have you sitting there this morning saying, why are we even talking about this? What does this have to do with anything? It has to do with everything because the churches or so-called churches today are filled with people living this. They go around professing to know the Lord, but they're living just like this. Once it comes off the tongue, you can't take it back. Exactly. I see it all the time in my job. Yeah. How often do we see it in our family? How often do we say something, we say, oops, I wish I hadn't said that. I'm guilty of it. You know? Doesn't the Bible tell us something about being slow to what? Speak. Yeah, you think of, uh, and it's just something we all have to work on, guys. I mean, we're not, this should be our goal. You know, we should not be ever satisfied where we are in the Lord. We should always be striving to be more Christ-like, I guess, is what I want to encourage just all of this morning to be. Don't ever get to the point where you say, well, I'm pretty good, I've been doing this. Quite a while, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at. Matthew's chapter 12. We're getting ready to close. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, we're reminded of this, but I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Again, it goes back to what well, I was talking over here in Titus about uh, being idle talkers, talebearers, gossipers. A believer shouldn't be that. What about those who are devices or cause disunity in the church? Titus 3, 10, and 11 says this, read we over in chapter 3 it says this reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition knowing that such a person is warped and sinning being self condemned so if you run into somebody that all they want to do is be devices it tells us that we should uh, avoid those people Years ago, we sort of learned the hard way here. <laughs> we stayed up late trying to convince people of like nail and jello on a wall. What you have to start out with is the scriptures. If you're willing to, if we can show you in scripture truth in regards to this matter, would you be willing to submit to what the Word of God says? And, and a lot of times we discover that people say, well, I don't really care what that is. Yeah. And meeting we, hope. Yeah, where we go. learn the hard way. We we didn't start that way at first. We would thought we'd have a discussion, and but 
we came to the conclusion that this isn't work. We need to make sure that we understand at the very beginning we're more concerned with what the Bible says. And if somebody's not willing to submit and teach blood in regards to that, then we can no sense me. First Timothy chapter six, we were reminded in uh, verses three and five, it says, "If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions." useless wranglings of men of corrupt <coughs> minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that, that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. And that's a great point that Jim brings up. If we're approaching in somebody, the, the immediate question we should ask is, if I can show you through God's word where you might be in error. You know, if you can't start out with that basis and they can't agree, yeah, if, you know, if you can show me, one is going to show you two things, their heart, you know, because a lot of times you're going to run into somebody and might say, I don't need you to show me anything. That tells me that uh, they've got a heart issue, a little bit of pride going on. You know, we should be have, with, with humility, we should be saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm open if you can show me through God's Word. I want to be accurate. But if they can't agree to that, you're wasting your time. If they're not going to take this as the truth, you're not going to convince them. So, just keep that in mind. Because you'll spend a lot of time with people, as Jim was saying, you can waste a lot of time with people that if they're not going to adhere to God's word, well, what, what are we doing here? You know. We all believe God's word is true. But have you grown to the point where it's sufficient? If it is. And I think a lot of times it shows us, it goes back to where we start. I'm going to close here because I don't want to get you late. We live what we believe. Right? If we believe God's word, we're going to be living it. Well, we may not be living it perfectly, obviously, but hopefully we're getting and growing and maturing as we go along. But we should not be remaining babes in Christ either. Can't say you're not getting solid food. You say you can't say you're not getting accurate teaching, sound doctrine, because we know we are. So I always go back to James. We can sit here and we can go over this. We can shake our head. Yeah, that sounds good. That's true, and I know that's right. <clears throat> One thing to be hearers of what God tells us. It's another thing to be doers. And I would encourage you to realize it's it's more important to be the doer than the hearer. Because a lot of people hear it. So any other comments? We'll go on and close there, leave it with that. Hope that's been beneficial. Let's keep Doug in our prayers. That he'll be back on his feet. If not, let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity this morning. We just thank you that we have your word that we fall back on that we not our opinion or what we think or our guessing game, you've laid out a plan. You've given us clear instructions on how and how we should live a godly life and how we can live a life that honors you and that benefits us. And we're just so thankful for that. So be with us as we continue to worship this morning. May everything that we say and do in this building this morning bring praise and glory to your name and grow us and make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.